studied planet in the solar system after the Earth. But none of these missions might have happened if it hadn't have been for the new views of Mars that Mariner 9 had returned from orbit. The images it began to beam back in 1971 caught the eye of a new breed of scientist, the planetary geologist. The first project I worked on was the Mariner 9 uh, photo reconnaissance of Mars. It took uh, thousands of images of, of, of Mars from orbit and gave us a much more vital Mars, uh, channels, valleys, uh, uh, volcanoes, uh, large collapse features, a wonderful, wonderful new set of features to look at and gave us hope that Mars was a much more active planet. Mars demanded an even closer look. NASA's next mission carried two landers. The Vikings accomplished the first successful touchdown on Mars in 1976, returning enticing pictures of the surface. Dave Pieri was at mission control. It was uh, spectacular. There was the landing pad uh, of the spacecraft on the Martian surface. And of course, shouts and you know, of joy rang out through the room. I mean, it was, uh, it was pandemonium, it was fun. Yeah! Viking was a triumph of robotic exploration. The landers spent five years sitting on the surface of Mars, watching the seasons change around them. It was as if we were there ourselves. Thinking about what it would be like to step out on the Martian surface is a very interesting exercise in, in, in science, um, not so much fiction, because now we do have a, a lot of data. You would see this reddish or yellowish brown surface with sort of a butterscotch sky. Everything would have this reddish color to it. It's an incredibly inhospitable environment, incredibly cold, incredibly dry, incredibly desiccating. And in such dry, desiccated conditions, Mars can be an incredibly dusty place. The Martian sky is full of dust. It constantly rains out onto the ground only to be sucked up again and pumped back into the sky by giant dust devils that plague the plains. Until humans head for the Red Planet, there's only Earth to practice on, and the Atacama Desert in northern Chile is one of the most Mars-like places on Earth. Space agencies even come here to test their robotic missions before they head to Mars. And film companies find it useful too. And whilst it might look the part, daytime temperatures out here couldn't be more different. Whilst the actors sweated at over 30 degrees centigrade, the robots exploring Mars have to endure sub-zero conditions. NASA's latest robotic explorers were built to survive the severe chill of the harsh Martian nights when temperatures are 60 degrees colder than during the day. Well, most things don't like 60 degrees centigrade temperature changes. Most electronics, you know, your computers like to be in air-conditioned buildings. <laughs> you basically create a warm electronics box underneath the rover. And at night, you hunker down and you try to stay as warm as you can for that cold spell until the next day when the sun comes up and you can get more energy. That is the hardest technical challenge. Both rovers managed to survive these freezing nighttime temperatures for over eight months, traveling around their landing sites, each standing at the height of a human and staring out across a new view of Mars every day. For the first time in history, there is this cadre of people on Earth that just do Mars. We're Martians, <laughs> and we are explorers. We're exploring Mars in a way that has never been done before. As NASA's rovers continued to explore the surface, uncovering a growing body of evidence that water once flowed across the ground here, the European Space Agency's Mars Express spacecraft had begun to chart the planet from above. The best camera to ever scrutinize the surface was revealing a new, more detailed Mars than had ever been seen before. But it was traces of methane which the spacecraft found in the atmosphere which stole the headlines. Was this the breath of alien life or just volcanic gases seeping out? The mission's infamous Beagle 2 lander could have answered this question, but the probe was lost during its descent to the surface. 
the quest to explore Mars goes on. Mars and Venus have dominated robotic exploration of the planets, and perhaps in our lifetime, humans will follow to Mars. But exploration of the outer solar system, far beyond our neighboring worlds, is a much greater challenge. In 1970, no one knew if they could even get a spacecraft safely across the asteroid belt that lay between us and the outer planets. But that didn't stop them trying. Pioneer 10 was built and launched to trailblaze the route to Jupiter. Pioneer 10 was the first uh, venture beyond the orbit of Mars. First time we were going into such enormous distances. First time we were about to cross the asteroid belt, which lies between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So it was a very hazardous and high risk uh, mission. And we had a keen sense of its historic possibilities in, in blazing the trail to the outer planets. Proving a lot of critics wrong, Pioneer 10 had made it across the asteroid belt intact. But mission scientist James Van Allen was in for a shock as the probe hurtled towards Jupiter. As we went in, the radiation intensity got greater and greater and greater and greater and greater and greater. And there was a very um, strong apprehension about the survival of the electronic equipment in the spacecraft. But it went up to a maximum, kept going up and up, and we did survive. And then it started back going down again. So we, of course, breathed a sigh of relief that we had finally made it. But the first pictures to come back from Pioneer 10 looked badly distorted. The detail of cloud bands and giant storms visible through telescopes on Earth were barely discernible as the robot sensors grew ever more strained as it passed through the planet's severe magnetic field. Over 30 years after it left Earth, Pioneer 10 still flies on. This historic robot has outlived many of the engineers who designed and built it. Although its power system is now failing, it will continue on silently towards the stars. But it was humanity's first brush with Jupiter that Pioneer 10 will always be remembered for. The gas giant has no surface to land on. A robot entering its atmosphere would fall for days before reaching Jupiter's pitch black center where under extremes of pressure and temperature, a core of metallic liquid hydrogen is thought to be churning, generating the severe magnetic field that Pioneer 10 had endured. And any human explorers encountering Jupiter would have to take even greater precautions against the planet's radiation belts. The magnetic field is going up. Our very own Northern Lights. Such a technology is still just a dream. And for the real missions bound for Jupiter, alternative solutions were needed to survive. Launched to take advantage of a rare grouping of all the big planets on the same side of the Sun, Voyager 1 and 2 left Earth in the summer of 1977. They would head directly for Jupiter, using the planet's immense gravity to accelerate them further out towards Saturn, Uranus, and eventually Neptune. The two spacecraft carried humanity's only hope of a close-up look at these outer planets. These were the most complicated spacecraft that had ever been launched. They have three sets of computers which all were interacting with each other. And initially, we were struggling to learn how to tell a spacecraft to do things so it would do them in the right way. And in about six months, we finally learned how to fly this very complex machine. 
And we spent the time between Earth and Jupiter getting ready with all the computer programs that the spacecraft is going to need to do all the observations as we flew by Jupiter, because we had just one chance to do it. And so we had to be sure we had planned to use the time very efficiently. Uh, so we were very anxious, of course, when we started our, our far encounter phase, when our we first images of Jupiter came back, and we knew that we were on a mission of discovery. Two years after leaving Earth, and after a journey of half a billion miles, the voyagers were nearing Jupiter. Already we could see Jupiter with unprecedented detail, uh, with winds of hundreds of miles per hour, jet streams, literally dozens of hurricane-like storm systems, many as large as the Earth itself, uh, and the Great Red Spot two or three times the size of the Earth. And then the moons, of course, which look unlike anything that we've seen here on Earth, uh, would just be stunning. During their flybys, the voyagers had snapped fleeting pictures of Jupiter's four big moons. Callisto, Ganymede, Europa, and Io. Although this was our first close encounter with these worlds, no one expected them to be more than frozen, dead places like our moon. Well, almost no one. Back in the 70s, I was just a kid. Uh, fresh out of high school and working at my first job and my boss was a guy who had done a calculation just before the flyby that the moon Io might be volcanic. Active volcanoes erupting on such a tiny moon were thought by most geologists to be impossible. But these first pictures from Voyager revealed a strangely fresh surface. They had all the appearance of recent lava flows. We were very puzzled. Of course, when we first saw Io, we didn't know what we were seeing because there were no impact craters. There were all these black blotches, large rings. It was only after the encounter, actually, that it all fell together when we saw a plume several hundred kilometers above the surface that we knew that there was active volcanism on the surface, a hundred times more activity than on Earth, and it had completely covered up all the old craters, and all those black blotches were lakes of liquid lava. When I showed up for my first day at work, they had gotten the data back, and they were so excited. They were right. And uh, to make a prediction that's right is one of the sweetest things that can happen. But the intensity of volcanic activity on this moon took everyone by surprise. At first, volcanologists like John Spencer found it hard to believe what they were seeing. I remember just how amazing and how bizarre these places looked, and particularly seeing one of the pictures of the volcanoes erupting on Io, and first seeing the picture and think, what, what on earth is that? All that can be, there must be a, a meteorite impact on the surface that happened right at the moment that they took the picture in, but I thought, that's crazy. So then I looked at the caption and saw this was actually an erupting volcano, just uh, being totally blown away by that. Quite how such a tiny moon as Io could still be so hot inside remained a puzzle. This was just one reason to head back to Jupiter, and whilst the voyagers carried on to Saturn, a new mission was being readied to return to the giant planet and its clutch of moons. Four, three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of Atlantis and the Galileo spacecraft bound for Jupiter. The mission was already running behind schedule when it was launched. Houston now controlling. Roger roll, Atlantis. And as Galileo headed for space, there were more setbacks waiting. When it was finally launched, we rapidly found out that its main antenna was failing to open and it's hard to fix a spacecraft that's millions of miles from Earth. The team had already waited over 10 years to get back to Jupiter and a stuck antenna wasn't going to stop them now. Every day was a challenge to basically keep the spacecraft going, redesign things that didn't quite work anymore. It was almost like having an old car in the garage. Uh, and you got to figure out just how much you could turn the accelerator and put, pump the gas a little bit to get it to go. You knew all the quirks that it needed to uh, continue to perform. And we got to the point where we, were, we knew our machine like an old car. Okay. Galileo's weak signal was boosted and data compressions were created to save the mission as it flew towards its difficult date with Jupiter and the radiation belts. Now we've got not just to fly by like the Voyagers, but we've got to go in there. Some of the moons we want are embedded deep inside this, this uh, high energy radiation environment and we want to explore that. 
Project engineers decided they'd only risk the highest radiation flybys of Io towards the end of the mission. But the views they got proved to be worth the risk.